this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that will determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views, and of course they happen to be, oh well, for the next hour they're going to be the views of Dr. Dennis Cuddy as we begin looking at what's going on in the world today and basically Dr. Cuddy. Cuddy, what are we going to be talking about? Are we going to be talking about your latest book, The Power Elite, Their History and Their Future? Go right ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that's what we'll we'll be getting into. Uh, I'll just make a, a short uh, comment, though, as a reminder to any of your listeners who uh, may not have been uh, listening the last uh, week or so regarding uh, the uh, contemporary situation and how uh, they uh, operate how the parallel operates to manipulate. Uh, one of my chapters is uh, the, uh, regarding misdirection and another one uh, regarding psychological conditioning of the American people that we've covered. And uh, what, what they do is a, a total attack upon the, the culture. And by the culture, I've, I've previously explained that I won't go into it again about how they would use art, how they would use music, now they would use television, uh, movies. Uh, every aspect is covered. You, you really can't leave uh, anything out. If you're going to change the values of a country, and you have to be able to change the values of a country before you can uh, bring about your ultimate uh, uh, plan, your goal, which would be the world socialist government. Uh, socialism emphasizes the group. Uh, American uh, individualism, of course, is the opposite of that. So you have to transfer... Uh, the individual's uh, thinking to sort of a group think. Uh, that, that's, uh, there was actually a term about 50 or 60 years ago, group think, where they would get individuals. And they every once in a while have these what I call psychological probes. Uh, so what they, they had to do was start conditioning people in a, in a certain direction. So what you would find is, and this, uh, uh, when I was a youngster and a teenager, it was always curious to me, as to how in the 60s you had the hippies, and the hippies would be rebellious against their parents. And you have uh, students' rights, so they would rebel against the teacher, and you have, you know, the individual students became uh, an individual who would uh, challenge his parents. Before then, children in the 50s and 40s, and before that, were very respectful of their parents. Uh, uh, someone who was older was considered wise, and wisdom uh, was very important. Uh, but now, when you change them to a, as I call it, a temporocentric attitude that only now is important, of course, the older people, who cares about them? You know, their knowledge is of the past. They're not going to be around much longer, so, you know, who really cares? Uh, they're not with it. They're not hip. You know, there are all these little words that would come up about 50, 60 years ago to, to identify this difference. And uh, older people were put down as old fogies. You know, there would be these terms for them. And so several things uh, were going on simultaneously. Uh, first of all, you would find, and this is what sort of uh, surprised me, I was always uh, an inquisitive sort of person and I wanted to know why was something going on. And so what you would find is that the hippies would say, well, we're rebelling, you know, against our parents, and we don't want to be like them. We want to be individuals. But in their individualism, they all dressed alike. They all, you know, had the beads and the hair, and, the, <laughs> and so I said, "Well, what's what's different? You're you're all you look like each other now. Yeah, you're different from your parents, but you're all alike. So where, where's this individualism? But that's how uh, the parallel can condition a group, a whole group of individuals, to think that they are becoming individualistic when actually they're following a sort of basic herd mentality. It's just, you know, a little different, but it's, it's a group thing. And I think it's so important that people understand that our minds are molded, or our ideas are formed largely by people we've never even heard of. We'll be back in a moment. 
Well, this is Dr. Cuddy. I guess this afternoon is Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And Dr. Cuddy certainly is, uh, was, works in the Reagan Department of Education. He's taught at the university level. Uh, certainly he has certainly uh, been a consultant to industry. But he's a prolific writer. He's written a number of books. And at least all of his books that are currently in print, why we do carry, and I will tell you, I really believe there's been an organized effort to get some of these books out of print. And if we ever have the opportunity, why we're going to get them back into print because we think that Dr. Cuddy's writings are vitally important. But Dr. Cuddy is going to be talking with us this afternoon. I suddenly starting already to mention how our minds are molded or ideas formed or tastes suggested largely by men we've never heard of. The media is controlled, ladies and gentlemen. There are six major corporations that control 90% of the media outlets. And of course, this is covered in a book that we carry called The New Media Monopoly. The New Media Monopoly, written by a professor of journalism at the University of California, and that, of course, was AOL, Time Warner, uh, that was, of course, Bertelsmann, Viacom, that controls CBS, Disney, that controls ABC. Comcast now controls over 120 radio stations and NBC. And then, of course, we have Sydney, uh, the Murdoch, that has a vast holdings, the London Times, uh, Sydney, uh, the Wall Street Journal, all of the newspapers and radio stations and television stations. And the average individual doesn't really understand that a small group of people mold our minds, form our tastes, and and basically the individual doesn't understand that our reality is created by the people who control the medium. And believe me, if it weren't that we were paying uh, for our radio time and uh, across America, we would not have the voice that we have. That's why we need your help. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, Yeah, and uh, uh, what they do is uh, they not only... uh, lose the plates to books like they did Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. But in my case, uh, what you find is that they just steal them uh, from libraries. Uh, I went uh, the other day to a local library here. They had had all total about 60 copies of my various books at one time, and only two were left. So what uh, what happens is they just go in and take them. Uh, and you'll find this happening all over the country. And let me just say to how Amazon does this. Amazon does this. If it's a really good book, oh, they'll offer it for you for a hundred dollars, a hundred and forty dollars, two hundred dollars. Right. Who's got to put that amount of money out? Look and see what Dr. Cuddy's books. Uh, some of them are price price completely out of range. Uh, they're available. You just can't afford them. Well, this is Dr. Stan. I guess it's Dr. Dennis Cuddy. We're talking about certainly mind control, how they're able actually to regulate and control largely what we think, because they, there are six major corporations that control uh, certainly 90% of the media outlets covered in a book available through Radio Liberty. We have to use secondhand copies of it. We wanted to carry the book, actually, but of course they ran the, they, uh, ran the price up. We can't buy the book and actually carry it new copies of the book because we would actually be losing money if we did. So basically, of course, we carry used copies of the book, The New Media Monopoly, written by Professor Ben Bagdikian, a liberal left-wing professor from the University of California, but he did a wonderful job, the book, The New Media Monopoly. The New Media Monopoly, you can get it by calling 1-800-544-8927. Of course, our guest, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and you can go up there and look at his books so many of his books, at least the older ones, they're so expensive. Oh, they have them, all right. They're so expensive, nobody's going to buy them. That's how they suppress the information. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, right. Uh, the Globalist, that uh, that particular book written about 15 years ago, uh, the minimal price for a new one is about $137. $137, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I mean, how many people do you think are going to put on $137? You're not going to. But that's what it's all about. That's how they do this. And, and basically, of course, this is how they do it with so many of the books. They want to suppress And Amazon, at least certain people working at Amazon, I don't know who it is, but somebody certainly suppresses certain books they don't want you to read. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Yeah, and uh, uh, I remember seeing on Amazon one of one of the uh, uh, new copies that went for five hundred forty dollars, and another one was advertised for two thousand dollars of that uh, that same book. 
So apparently that's one they really don't <laughs> want you to look at. Uh, yeah, and, and so there's there are various ways of uh, them controlling your processes by which you make decisions and, and so on. And as uh, I was saying before the, the previous break, uh, they were they were actually able, like uh, Bertrand Russell said in his book, The Impact of Science on Society, there was two editions. One was 1951, one was 1953, that you could uh, have a, a mass, as he called it, mass psychology, or you could say group think, where you not only psychologically condition an individual, but entire groups of people to, to think in a particular way. And Orwell, in his book 1984, was talking about do speak. You know, you'd use certain words, and people actually come to say uh, something is the opposite of what it actually is. You know, war is really peace, freedom is really slavery, you know, things like that. And at the time, or back when I was uh, coming up and we would read that, that type of book, we'd say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, who's, who's going to fall for that? Uh, but then you have the recent uh, campaign switch by uh, the Democrats in Congress, where uh, when people started saying how Obamacare was very, very bad, they, they couldn't roll it out on time, the website didn't work, our premiums are going up, you said I could keep my doctor and I can't, so on and so on, and there were particular provisions about how many hours you could work and so on, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Chuck Schumer and the rest of these guys really actually, and, and your listeners, if they listen to any of these major talk shows, they'll they'll pick up on this. About a month and a half ago, they actually started coming out and saying, well, you know, because these people are out of work, you know, they can't work a full, full-time job, so that's really good, because they'll they'll be able to be more creative. Maybe, maybe you, I remember, I think it was Chuck Schumer, so I say, you know, if you've ever wanted to say, paint, well, now's your chance. You know, it's good that you're not working, because now you can you can express your creativity in painting, so this is freedom, and, and this is a kid. good thing. And it's wonderful, you know, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We have oh, almost 50 million Americans on food stamps today. I mean, so it used to be uh, we had just only about one in every 55 people on food stamps. Now it's about one in about every six or seven people is on food stamps today. And basically, we have Medicare. We have Social Security. We have certainly housing allotments. We have over 130 different federal programs that will provide for people. And it is wonderful. There's no country in the world that provides the high living standards that we provide for the American people. And it's wonderful, except that we can't afford it. The only way that they're able to do what we're doing today is to borrow a trillion dollars a year. And they're lying about, ladies and gentlemen, when Barack Hussein Obama became the president of the United States, the national debt was $10.7 trillion, $10.7 trillion. Today, the federal debt is $17.5 trillion. We've increased the debt almost $7 trillion uh, suddenly in a little over five years. How long can you continue doing this? Well, you can't. Eventually, it's going to be destroyed. And of course, everybody will lose everything. But that's exactly what they want. And out of the chaos that they intend to produce, and the, who are they? Why they are what I call the Brotherhood of Darkness, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, but you need to get my book and read it. We tell you exactly who they are. Out of the chaos that's coming will come the people demanding the government to take care of them, and they're going to. And they'll have the concentration camps where you can go and get a free food stamps at free food anytime you want to. The only trouble is you're not going to be able to leave. And millions are going to be killed in the coming war. And the war is coming. I can't tell you when it is. But the war is coming. There's certainly going to be a collapse of our financial system and all the people who have all this money certainly laid aside in, in bonds and in stocks and certainly in annuities and in pensions and in all these monetary increments. They're all going to become impoverished. And the average individual says it couldn't happen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not only could happen, it's going to happen. Because, of course, our monetary system is controlled by a privately owned central bank. I said to you, the uh, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve System. It's not a branch of the federal government. It's privately owned. In fact, basically, the number two man of the new Federal Reserve is going to be a man named Stanley Fisher. Where did Stanley Fisher come from? Why, well, he's been the chairman of the uh, Central Bank of Israel. Why don't we get an American as the head of our central bank? Oh, well, he has dual citizenship. Go right ahead, Dennis. 
uh, right. <laughs> and uh, what what they do is uh, it, it's not it's not blatant and obvious. Uh, in other words, they don't walk up to you and say, "Hi, you know, you're out of work. Go sit over there. We'll take care of you." They they don't do like that. It's like incremental. So what they'll do is they'll say at first to, to get you sort of to accept it is they'll have like Obamacare. And they deliberately make it a disaster. You know, they can't possibly, nobody could be, is this incompetent by accident? You know, they can't. They just can't. And so they say, oh, my goodness. And the people throw up their hands. Oh, this is awful. How am I going to pay? The premium's going to, hey, no problem. We'll subsidize it. See? And that way they get uh, the insurance companies to buy into it, right? Because in the short run, the insurance companies, ordinarily you think they don't want to, to get into this mess. But, hey, you know, if the government's going to subsidize it, so they guaranteed, you know, the insurance companies won't suffer any big loss. But how is the government going to afford to subsidize it? <laughs> and the thing is, they don't have the money, so they simply create the money right. out of nothing. Uh, what madness is that? And, of course, we've created almost $7 trillion in debt remember, in, in less than a little over five years. Remember, it took a trillion, it took uh, 200 years to accumulate $1 trillion in debt. Now we're running more than a trillion dollars of debt every year, and they tell us, oh, well, things aren't going to be so bad this coming year. But they're simply lying. The same people who told us, you can keep your doctor under Obamacare. You can, go to, uh, you can keep your insurance under Obamacare. They were lying, and they're lying about the debt this year. It's going to be phenomenal. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, right. Now, you, you, you might say, well, uh, how can they do this? this? This is incredible, and so on. And what I find is that I and other people, like Dr. Stan and others, we, we look at this, and because we're of the old school, we're almost like Winston, uh, the character who's being tortured by O'Brien, who's Big Brother's uh, henchman. You're talking about in, 19, in, in George Orwell's 1984. Right. Go 1984. ahead. 1984. You know, the people will never put up with this. And time and time again, the, the people do because the people have been conditioned to, to think in a certain way. 50, 60 years ago, uh, the, the people would, would have never been snookered by this, hey, we'll subsidize it. But now what you find out is whenever there's this problem and somebody says, well, oh, the government will, well, the insurance companies, and their executives aren't idiots either, uh, will subsidize and say, oh, well, okay, no problem. Uh, in fact, there was this, uh, I was at this cafeteria yesterday, and this fellow who had two law degrees, and uh, we were talking about various things. He's a nice fellow. He's there with his daughter. And uh, I was talking about the debt uh, only about uh, 15 years ago was $1.3 trillion, and now it's $17 trillion. You know, that quickly it just uh, exponentially increases. And he says, oh, well, we owe it to ourselves, so what's the problem? And I said, you know, back in the 60s, when I was in college, I took uh, a lot of different courses. I took a couple of courses in Russian history, a couple of courses in economics, because I want to have this broad background. And I said, that's what the economics professor said. Well, now, yeah, yeah, we're, we're packing up this debt. <laughs> but he said, hey, don't worry, we just owe it to ourselves. And then somebody chimed in. I forget whether it was myself or somebody else that said, yeah, but isn't there a point at which the interest on the debt is going to reach critical proportions? Oh, that'll never happen, he said. You know, don't worry about it. You know, this fiat money system, hey, you know, it's okie dokie, and we, we need it, you see, for growth. The economy, you know, growth, got to have the growth and all. And so uh, the people begin to, to buy that. They, they literally buy into it. And that's why to, to you and me and uh, the listeners to this program, the, the idea that the Democrats would come along a month and a half ago and say, uh, no problem with unemployment or reduced employment because you can't work, you know, 30 hours a week and so forth. It's freedom. You know, you now get to paint. To the, yeah, okay, well, you're unemployed, but hey, don't look at it as being unemployed. In the past, remember, employment was good. We want people to work. But now, unemployment, as far as the Democrats are concerned, no as a result of Obamacare, the hours you can work before it you know, kicks in that you have to provide insurance. This is good. Being well, unemployed or less employed hours, less money, this is a good thing. Hold well, that thought. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the people on the other side are scared to death. They know it's going to collapse. They just don't want you to know until it's too late and they can declare their dictatorship. Well, go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. 
Okay, so uh, you and I look at this as ab- absolutely ridiculous, uh, but uh, believe me, uh, the Democrats would do that, something that sounds absolutely insane, unless they thought they could get away with it, unless they thought they could get away. And unfortunately, it's like the book 1984 and Winston saying, you know, the people will never, never succumb to it. I'm, I'm pretty sure the people will, because they've been in, in schools, they've been dumbed down, They've thought, uh, they've been conditioned to think, as I call it, temporocentrically, meaning now is, uh, is what's important. And, uh, and they, you know, don't worry about uh, tomorrow. And it's, it's not really due. I mean, the, uh, you know, Epicureans believe back in ancient Greece, you know, live, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you may die. You know, and that was their, their, uh, attitude. Then there were the Stoics and, you know, Stoicism. And they, they're, they're all of these manners of thinking which uh, aren't really new, but they've refined it now, the parallel through various psychological techniques and advertising and music and the emphasis on pleasure. The pleasure is very, very important. And that's why you had in uh, Huxley's books uh, and, and Orwell's and others, you had, uh, remember, Soma, S-O-M-A, Soma. You take this little pill or something, and it would give you sort of a, 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 a sexual high just by taking the little pill, and they kept popping them and popping them and popping them all the time because that's all that mattered, that, that feeling of pleasure. So you get people hooked on drugs, heroin, you know, gradual, you know, get them on pot, you know, marijuana, marijuana, pot, and so on, graduate to cocaine, and then and so forth, and you'd be going up the ladder because why? Well, pleasure is all that matters. Now, in the past, it used to be that you would diff for pleasure. You wouldn't say go go out and, and buy something you could, unless you could pay for it. You know, okay, I've, pay, I've earned enough money to buy a washing machine, you know, 1952 or whatever. Okay, here I go. Here's my money. Give me my washing machine. But then the paralegal, of course, says, well, buy it on credit. You know, just credit. You can have it now. Oh, good. You know, I can buy it on credit. I don't have to have the money to pay for it now. And so you run up a lot of debt. So once they get the public, condition to going into debt themselves, they personally, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump before you get the society to go in debt, right? See, see how their, their mind works? And so they, they have this process. It's sort of a step by step by step. And so uh, they call it one thing, like uh, today I mentioned about freedom. Unemployment is a good thing because it gives you freedom to be creative. Back in the 60s, uh, one of their techniques, as I said, was, well, you have a generation gap, and you, you separate the parents from their, their children, and that does uh, a number of things. And then you create uh, this new, what you call individualism, but it's not individualism because they were all alike, you know, all wearing the blue jeans and and the hippie beads and the long hair and so forth, proclaiming how individualistic they were, right? And then you you drive that to a point of absurdity, uh, and, and you you could literally hear this. You you I remember you could go to these coffee shops. I didn't frequent the places, but I, I knew what they were, and I you know I know people who who were there, and they'd sit around babbling about nonsense. And I remember my mother and I were at uh, one of these philosophical discussions because it, you know, it was at the university and there were professors involved. And they kept talking about P and not P. And what they're talking about you know, was when a train reaches a station and that's point P, is it really P or is it not P? It depends upon your frame of... <laughs> that we, we hold, that thought, at hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan. I guess, of course, is Dr. Dennis Kelly pointing out that so much of what's going on today is totally illogical. They tell us certainly there's nothing to worry about from the debt. We owe it to ourselves. Well, of course, uh, anyway, basically what people don't understand is that certainly a lot of Americans also they owned uh, certainly uh, bonds, American T-bonds, and if they go bankrupt, those Americans go bankrupt. Basically, the uh, Japanese own about one2 a trillion dollars of American debt. The Chinese owe about $1.3 trillion of American debt. And they're gradually beginning to slowly dump that. They're selling it off and they're buying up. There's any property in the United States. They're buying up major corporations in the United States. And more and more of our corporations, more and more of our major businesses are being purchased by foreign entities. So soon we will simply become a satellite nation with very little owned by 
Americans. And this is happening as suddenly our debt is being disposed of by people throughout the world. Right now, of course, we're threatening the Russians. Oh, we're going to do terrible things to you unless you do what we want. Well, they're holding about 200 billion, between two and 300 billion dollars for American bonds. And they simply said, you give us a bad time, we'll simply dump our bonds. What will that do? Well, we may very well soon find out. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Yeah, and and what you what you have to do in preparation for all this is, as I said, a psychological conditioning. And I remember in the fifties there was a show, and you can still see some of these old shows on the old TV network that uh, broadcast old programs. Uh, there was one uh, in the late fifties. Uh, it was uh, Dobie Gillis was the name of the show, and they, you know, Maynard Krebs was the, <laughs> the sort of goofy guy who would be interested in, you know, bong- bongos and stuff like that, and they would go by this place, and all of the students, you know, the young college students would be sitting around and listening to this this person. They were either a professor or they were just some, some guy who professed to be wise, and he would be talking about these, you know, ethereal things and and how, you know, the mind works uh, to see, see that something really isn't real, really is real. And and, it's, and I explained in previous shows, so I won't go back through that, about how they would use art. You know, art used to have certain standards, but you want to do away with standards. So uh, a, a bunch of paint thrown on a canvas becomes real art. Ooh, look at that creativity there. Of course, it's, you know, junk. I mean, it, what does it take to throw paint on a canvas, right? No, nothing. But then they, it was all in the eye of the beholder. He's the eye of a, ooh, that, that looks great to me. And so and then the early 60s, they picked it up with a, an Andy Griffith show. And there's a go, goober. He, he wasn't supposed to be too bright and so forth. But somebody said, you know, if you wear a beard, it makes you look intelligent. And so he starts babbling about, yes, uh, the eye that I am was not the eye that I was. You know, all this sort of it, it, Study stuff, right? And that's supposed to look very profound. But ooh, and people go, oh, that's deep. You know, really a deep thinker there. And then they come along in the late sixties, and they they progress to uh, something called uh, F Troop. It's uh, Forrest Tucker and Larry Storch, I think, and it was a comedy about the cavalry. And every time they had a problem, they would go out to the Indian village, and there, you know, the Indian chief, and they say, well, you know, chief so and so, we've got this problem. Uh, you, know, they, you know, we don't have food and time or something like that, some real-world problem. And they look at him, and he would say something like, uh, when the moon covers the owl, before the dusk and night, and then they just <laughs> look at each other like, what? <laughs> and they walk away. And they do that, you know, periodically. They go for him, and he'd make this sort of babbling thing that was supposed to be full of meaning. You know, have to interpret this stuff, right? So anyway, uh, a lot of young people in colleges got caught up in this. And, of course, it didn't make any real sense, you know, but that's the point. That's the point, that it didn't really make any sense. And once you sort of shake up the mind like that, the, the process of thinking, what you do is you have destroyed the old way of thinking. And you have to do that before you can create the new way of thinking, which is what the, the power elite wants. And so what they would do is get your mind all messed up. And they believe me, a lot of kids in the 60s got their minds really messed up. And so then they could shift it towards, as I said, this sort of temporocentric thinking where they speed up, quicken the tempo of human life, like O'Brien said to Winston in Orwell's book, 1984. They would do, and they did. And so then people are kept so busy that all they can think about is now. And if you raise some question about history and try to point out the conspiracy of the uh, Federal Reserve and so forth, or if you try to tell them, well, look, what you're doing is messed up your, your values and you're going to hell and so forth, they would say something like, well, I, I, I just, I don't have time for that. I just, I don't have time for that. I got to go here. I got to go there. Big, 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 like that. And so once you get people focusing on the here and now, you can do all kinds of things to them because they degenerate into an almost instinctive reaction like an animal does. Uh, not quite, but you're going in that direction rather than calm, thoughtful analysis based on previous knowledge, history, as to where you're going. Well, that thought, Dr. Cuddy, and basically, ladies and gentlemen, you can't keep spending money you don't have, and that's just what we're doing. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay, well, the last thing I'll say about it is uh, its relevance to now and, and what, what I was talking about. When you have Obamacare, 
and you see what a mess it is, and you say, oh, my goodness, my premiums are going up. This is a disaster. And then the, the government comes along and say, yes, we'll subsidize it. This is the, the prelude to actually taking you over. we will subsidize it. Then the public, instead of thinking, you know, they don't want you to think. They want you to react, like I said, instinctively, sort of an emotional reaction. What uh, the public does is says, oh, okay, so you're going to subsidize it. Then everything's okay. Now, you and I and the listeners to the program and so forth know that the result of what they're doing with the subsidy and running up the debt is going to result in disaster, but that's the future. So you don't, most of the people have been conditioned to not think about the future. So if you actually sat down and tried to explain to them how this is going to all fall apart and tumble, the average person will say, I don't care or I don't understand because all that's important to me is now. The government is requiring me to get this insurance. I thought I was in a big, big trouble. You know, the premiums are going up, but oh, ah, an emotional sigh of relief. I'm going to get a subsidy, and that's all that I care about now. Now, in the past, it wasn't like that. In the past, it wasn't like that. People would actually care about, you know, if I if I go into debt, you know, what would happen to me. People used to avoid going into debt. They, they really would try to not, not go into debt uh, because of the uncertainty of job markets and so forth, because they had a knowledge of the past and they had a good idea as to how debt would get them in trouble down the road. Uh, there was even a, a show, uh, Leave it to Beaver, in the late 50s, where this one guy, sort of a cocky, uh, Eddie is his name, uh, know it all guy. He got into a credit card, and uh, Wally, who was Beaver's uh, a brother, wanted one too. And his father said, No, no. And he, he laid out the problems with a young person having a credit card. Sure enough, Eddie did get into that trouble. And he, he used his credit card to pay off one debt, and then he had to use his credit card to pay off that debt, and, and, and it just snowballed until the debt really went out of control. And so uh, Wally's father, Beaver's father, said, See, see what can happen. But for Eddie, who was all about now, gee, that's a great-looking vest. I hold want that, that thought, vest. Hold that thought. We're going to be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is certainly reiterating what I've said. And that is the whole financial system is coming down. And make your certainly your plans today and understand that they can destroy the value of your currency. Right now, we're running an inflation rate of about 8%. They're simply lying to us. But certainly look and see what's happening to the price of food. They keep telling you there's no inflation, nothing to worry about. But look and see what's happening to the price of clothing. Look and see what's happening to the price of food. Look and see what's happening to the price of milk and other products. And, and you see that they're progressively going up. And when they tell us that the inflation rate's only 1, 1.5%, it's simply a matter of lying. And then, of course, they tell us the economy is expanding. The economy is not expanding. It's contracting because, of course, they're lying about inflation. But then, of course, why wouldn't they lie to us? The American people are so gullible. But unfortunately, Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't make your plans now and get your financial house in order, the vast majority of the American people are going to get wiped out when the dollar collapses. How do I know it's going to collapse? Well, you go get Time Magazine, March, pardon me, May 13th, 2013. That's less than a year ago. Time Magazine, May 13th, 2013. On 13, read the article by Richard Haas, H-A-A-S-S. Who is Richard Haas, H-A-A-S-S? He is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is a member of the Trilateral Commission. He's one of the dozen most powerful men in the world. And there in this article in Time Magazine, he basically says he doesn't see any way to avoid a financial collapse. It's not a matter of if, but when this financial crisis materializes. Those are his words. It's not a matter of when, but if, not a matter of if, but when the financial the crisis materializes, and then he says things are not going to turn out well. Now, he's, of course, talking to the elite. They're making the preparations to protect themselves, but they're not telling the average individual that if you're not doing what is logical in times like this and making preparations, then you, like the people certainly in Argentina and the people in Chile and the people in, in Syria today and the people in Ukraine and people throughout the world are simply going to get impoverished and so 
into your stocks and bonds and anything that's tied to your pensions, your annuities, anything that's tied to paper dollars is going to be destroyed in value. Make your preparations now. Do not put it off. Our telephone number will go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Pick up the story. Let's get on to, to your book. Okay. Uh, so anyway, they've they've conditioned, and it's it's not without uh, it's not without uh, some basis. In fact, uh, they've been robbing from the Social Security so-called trust fund for years, and the public hasn't kicked out the, the members of Congress, and and they do da- dastardly things. And uh, when you say, well, why? How can they do this? Well, they say the the voting public has a short memory, and you know it's a long time before the next election, and by then the public will have forgotten. Well, well why has the public forgotten? Because the public has been conditioned to think, as I call it, temporocentrically. Only now is what's important. You know, you quicken the tempo of human life, so it's now, 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 now. That's all that matters just now. And I think it's so important for people to understand they're having to borrow a trillion dollars a year. They're having to borrow a trillion dollars a year so that they can write the Social Security checks, so they can certainly pay for Medicare and Medicaid, so that they can provide the food stamps. But how long can you continue borrowing a trillion dollars a year? You can't do it indefinitely. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, other countries throughout the world are beginning to dump their U.S. Treasury bonds. And when they start to do that in mass, Heaven help us. Go right ahead. Okay, so uh, to the book. Uh, the chapter that we're on now is the, the Oklahoma City bombing a- anniversary is the title of that chapter because I thought it would be useful to uh, look at a specific example, uh, specifically regarding terrorism as to how we've been told one thing uh, when it's really uh, not what's going on. And last uh, week uh, we were talking about uh, General Mahmoud uh, Ahmad as the head of ISI, Pakistani Intelligence, uh, just uh, one month uh, before the attack of 9-11 had uh, $100,000 wired to the ringleader, uh, Mohammed Atta. He's uh, one of the few non-Saudis uh, in this thing. He was an Egyptian and a member of an engineering society associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think that you're talking about, of course, the bombing of the the federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. And basically, of course, 168 people were killed. And, uh, but of course, course they were told that Timothy McVeigh did it. Uh, But of course, nobody knows where Timothy McVeigh is certainly uh, is buried. And if you get our four CD sets on that, and we talk to people who've talked to Timothy McVeigh, actually said, I'm going to have to be killed. That's the only way I'm ever going to get out of here. And uh, we actually, of course, uh, talk, uh, certainly, uh, and you'll hear a gentleman who actually uh, was a talk show host named William Cooper, who actually over and over again on his radio program played an interview with a woman who actually witnessed the, the, the execution of Timothy McVeigh. And a remark was, I didn't know you kept breathing after you were dead. And he kept playing that over and over again, this woman saying, I didn't know that you kept breathing after you were dead. And you know what happened to William Cooper? Why, they sent a SWAT team out and they said he attacked the police and so that's why they had to kill him. William Cooper, you can look it up on the Internet. This is not imaginary. Where is Timothy McVeigh uh, uh, buried? Nobody knows. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. I think he wound up the same place that Osama bin Laden did. <laughs> so probably, probably, probably the same place. And there's a number of these, uh, these other uh, individuals like that as well. Uh, so anyway, uh, what you find is that uh, General Mahmoud Ahmad, now this is 9-11, the attack of 9-11, which is after Oklahoma City, uh, had $100,000 wired to uh, Mohammed Atta, the Egyptian ringleader of the 9-11 attacks. So he had it wired one month before the attacks. Well, why am I bringing that up? Because Oklahoma City is much, you know, years before that. Well, what you have to remember is that Atta has visited a flight school in Oklahoma. And in uh, James Langston's uh, column in the Evening Standard, which is a London paper, October 21, 2002, it was titled, Iraqis Linked to Oklahoma Atrocity. Uh, one reads that, quote, two of the September 11th conspirators held crucial meeting at a motel in Oklahoma City in August 2001. The motel's owner had since identified them as ringleader Mohammed Atta and Zacharias Musawi. The motel is unremarkable except for one thing. It is where a number of witnesses are sure they saw McVeigh drinking and perhaps 
plotting with his Iraqi friends, end quote. End quote. Now, that's from the uh, London Evening Standard. And that raises uh, the possibility the Oklahoma City bombing was an Iraqi attack, or at least some Iraqi involvement, uh, perhaps as part of the secret Nazi plan, which is the title of my previous book. The one we're talking about now is called The Power Elite, Their History and Future. And the previous book to that is uh, The Power Elite and The Secret Nazi Plan, both of which are offered by uh, Radio Liberty. And I would encourage your listeners, if they don't you know, want to purchase it themselves, they can at least, at the very least, call up their local libraries and ask them to uh, order the book so that uh, at least it will be available to them. So uh, anyway, uh, as I mentioned, the secret Nazi plan, and uh, John Daugherty, uh, he, works for, he writes for World Net Daily, he had an article called Iraq Link to OKC, Oklahoma City, September 11 Attacks. And that was dated April 18, 2002. And what he, what he does there is quotes Oklahoma City attorney named John Johnston as saying his evidence, quote, will show that the Republic of Iraq and Saddam Hussein were involved in funding and planning the Oklahoma City bombing and that certain elements of the U.S. government must have known, end quote, about the foreign involvement all along. Uh, you might remember... Uh, at this point, that according to UPI uh, intelligence correspondent, uh, one of them named uh, Richard Sale, S A L E, he had a column on April 10th of 2003, and it was titled, quote, Exclusive Saddam Saddam Key in Early CIA Plot. And we won't go, uh, you know, into that too much, only that he says Saddam Saddam's, or Saddam Hussein's first contacts with U.S. officials date back to 1959 when he, uh, Hussein, was part of a CIA-authorized six-man squad tasked with assassinating then-Iraqi Prime Minister General Abd al karim Kassi. And I think, let me just repeat that. Saddam Hussein, who was the dictator in Iraq, who eventually was executed, was basically was part of a CIA team back in, in, the, in the 19th. Was that the, what year was that? Right, and uh, so at this point you're saying, well, why and how, you, you might be asking, would this be part of a, a, a secret uh, a secret Nazi plan? I mean, what's, what's that got to do with uh, the secret Nazi plan? Well, uh, for the answer to that, uh, you, you have to remember that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, his name was Haj Amin al-Husseini, uh, was put on the uh, Nazi payroll back in 1938, 1938, and one of his confidants, was Saddam Hussein's uncle. His name was a General uh, Karula Tulfa, T-U-L-F-A-H, who became uh, Saddam's mentor. So, you know, it's like Saddam, not his father, but this fellow was really his mentor. And according to uh, Chuck Morris, who was a radio talk show hope, uh, host up in Boston, he, um, he wrote a book called The Nazi Connection to Islamic Terrorism. And that came out about uh, 2003, and in his book, he says, quote, clearly Saddam Hussein was tutored in the al-Husseini brand of Muslim Nazism by his uncle from an early age and would become one of the most devout and effective practitioners of al-Husseini-inspired Nazi pan-Arabism, as his career uh, would attest, end quote. And then, uh, once again, in that article by James Langston I mentioned earlier, uh, he indicated that the sketch of the Oklahoma City bombing suspect John Doe number 2, remember the infamous John Doe number 2 that they supposedly never really found, uh, the uh, the sketch of that, uh, that person, John Doe number 2, is an almost perfect match for an Oklahoma City restaurant worker named uh, Hussein al-Husseini. That's a little different spelling. It's not the same guy from the 1930s, but his name was also al-Husseini, who, quote, has a tattoo on his upper left arm indicating he was once a member of Saddam's elite Republican Guard, end quote. And furthermore, uh, there's another column from the Wall Street Journal uh, about uh, 12 years ago, September 5, 2002, in the Wall Street Journal by uh, Michael Morrison, and it's titled The Iraq Connection. And in there, he quotes Patrick Lang, and Patrick Lang was former director of the uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency's uh, Human Intelligence Collection section. Uh, he quotes him as having written that Al Husseini, the current one, the, the one from Oklahoma City, Al Husseini was likely a member of Unit 999, 
of the Iraqi Military Intelligence Service, or uh, Istikhabarat, as they call it. No, no, you're talking, and this is in reference to the Oklahoma City bombing right. in 95. So these things all tie together, ladies and gentlemen. And that was certainly laying us open and preparing us for the uh, event that occurred in uh, Sydney, uh, September 11, 2001. But they, all you need to do is watch Building 7 come down. Watch Building 7 come down. It came down at 5.20 in the afternoon that day. All sorts of cameras focused on the building. Why would all the cameras be focused on the building? Well, so you can see what happened. And after all, we we're supposed to believe the building came down because, of course, it was hit by a plane, but it wasn't hit by a plane. And basically, if you watch it, you'll see how the center of the roof collapses first. That's what you do with a controlled demolition. You take out the central supports, the center of the roof collapses, and then the base of the building goes, and a controlled demolition. And Building 7 was a controlled demolition. There were obviously suddenly explosives in the building. And if Building 7 was a controlled demolition, then they took down the Twin Towers and they killed all those people there. Why? because they wanted an excuse to go to war with Afghanistan. After all, 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi Arabians. 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi Arabians. So we go to war with Afghanistan. And then, of course, we've got to go to war with Iraq, because they got weapons of mass destruction. And Sidney Colin Powell went on national television and went before the United Nations and said, you can trust me. Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. That's why we've got to attack Iraq. So we went in there and we killed a million people. And and then all shucks, well, they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And Colin Powell, at least to his credit, said, I'm embarrassed that I said it. Well, I mean, what about all those people who died? Well, he's embarrassed. Uh, He admits that they lied to him. But he lied to the American people, and we trusted Colin Powell. And basically then, of course, we still just getting out of Iraq now. We still have our troops in Afghanistan because, of course, what happened on September 11th. But that was a controlled demolition. And basically, that was not a controlled demolition by the Islamic terrorists. That has been covered up. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and if you look at the Twin Towers, there's, like Dr. Stan was saying about a controlled demolition, you, you have the columns, the external columns of the building fold into the center as you collapse the roof first, and then, you know, it doesn't have expansive damage externally. So, you know, it all collapses when it, within its own uh, geographic area. And so the, the problem with the, the Twin Towers, if you look at one of them, I think it was the first or the second one, where they have a lot of uh, close-ups of it, you see the top, uh, the top of the building, and it starts to collapse, but it doesn't collapse centrally. What happens is it starts to teeter-totter. It actually starts to bend over towards one side. Now, if you run uh, a little experiment on your own, you know, you construct your own little experiment out in your backyard or whatever, if a heavy object starts to tilt to one side, One of two things is going to happen. It's either going to continue tilting and fall off the side of the existing structure, or as it tumbles, the force of its disproportionate weight on one side will cause what's underneath it to tilt, to break off to the opposite side. It's sort of like, you know, if you you put pressure on one side of things, like a tree or something, it's going to go what's underneath the other way. Well, in this case, with the Twin Towers, it didn't do that. It starts to topple, and then instead of just going, you know, falling off, uh, or what's underneath it being pushed in the opposite direction, the whole rest of the tower just goes boom, 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 boom. You know, pancakes straight down. But the top of the building vaporizes. That's it. And over a thousand bodies, they could never find even one little fragment of bone. How could you vaporize all those bodies as if this was simply a, 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 a collapse? And, of course, you couldn't. You had to have some sort of explosive to vaporize all those bodies. And they found little fragments of some of the bodies, you know, a couple hundred yards away on the top of other roofs of other buildings. How would they get over there if there wasn't explosions? And, of course, there were explosions, ladies and gentlemen. They killed those people. It was frank murder. And they were willing to kill them and got away with killing almost 3,000 people that day. I mean, look at the hole in the side of the Pentagon. No airliner went through a 15-foot hole. 
and look at the hole that was there before they, when the building collapsed. Basically, if they would kill those people, do you think they're going to hesitate to kill hundreds of millions of people here in America in the coming conflict? And they're not. And you better get involved, because if you're not, you'll have nobody to blame by what's coming down the line. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and we carry his books. You want to get them. Some of the finest books we have available on the tragedy that's unfolding in the world today. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. We've got three minutes to wrap up the program. Well, uh, uh, back to the book, what I was saying about all this Iraq connection and how does this connect with the Oklahoma City bombing participants, uh, Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols, uh, you find in the U.S. News and World Report a column uh, shortly after uh, the, the uh, attacks of 9-11. It's October 29th of 2001. And uh, it's the, the Washington Whisper section of the U.S. News and World Report uh, you find that, quote, a few top defense officials think Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh was an Iraqi agent. The theory stems from a never-before-reported allegation that McVeigh had allegedly collected Iraqi telephone numbers. Why haven't we heard this before about the case of the executed, quote, executed McVeigh? Conspiracy theorists in the Pentagon think it's part of a cover-up, end quote. Now, that's U.S. News & World Report. U.S. News and World Report saying that uh, conspiracy theorists, theorists in the Pentagon think it's part of a cover-up. In addition to that, Kelly uh, Patricia O'Meara had a column called Iraq Connections to U.S. Extremists. That was in Insight Magazine, which is affiliated with the Washington Times. That was December 3, 2001. Uh, she wrote in the connection of Terry Nichols to uh, elements of Iraqi intelligence as well. Now, I can't prove that the Oklahoma City bombing was part of the secret Nazi plan uh, about which I've written, but it could be considered as being helpful in the fulfillment of the plan today. And you can certainly say that. Uh, most of the CIA's covert operations in that part of the world came uh, from uh, Pakistan, through, and it was run through the Pakistani intelligence ISI. And of interest, uh, perhaps relevant to the secret Nazi plan, is the fact that Germany was key in helping Pakistan get atomic weapons, get the atomic weapons that it has. And between, uh, I guess, 200,000 and 300,000 uh, second and third level Nazis, remember, according to my previous book, went underground in Germany alone during World War II, and they would be important in carrying out the secret Nazi plan for world controlled, uh, as with thousands uh, of the high level Nazis, that's the SS members, who spread throughout the world. Uh, so I guess time's about up, but we'll pick up next time with the continuation of the Oklahoma City bombing, which occurred on uh, April 19th of uh, that year, 95. And uh, it's being part of the secret Nazi plan about which my previous book is concerned. Dr. Cuddy, it's always a pleasure to have you with us, and we'll look forward to having you with us again next week. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap up the program. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and uh, we hope you enjoy the conversation with Dr. Cuddy every week. We do carry all the books as we of his that are in print today, and you can get the others at Amazon, 100 150 $200. Uh, so they, uh, you can find them up there listed under uh, on Amazon, but of course, this is how they suppress the information. They have the books, but they jack the price up, knowing full well that people won't buy them. So what we do have is Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, the power elite, their history and their future. I said the, the uh, 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 quotations on the New World Order. And basically, just give us a call at 1 800 1-800-544-8927 and ask for Dr. Cuddy's books and they're available by giving us a call. And then, of course, we do hope many of you, you might be interested in knowing what really happened on September 11th. We have a four CD set called 9-11. We have one called 9-11 Update. We have one called Why Did the Buildings Come Down? Where actually we interviewed the gentleman who was actually, it was his job, he was employed uh, to actually clean up the debris and he arrived the day after the uh, uh, the collapse of uh, building number seven. And he, I, I asked him, I said, is this a controlled demolition? And he said, 99% certain. 9-11, 
Finally, the building number seven was a controlled demolition. It was a controlled demolition, ladies and gentlemen. The whole thing was fraudulent. The people on the airplanes, it's the name, American Flight 11, I think one, uh, uh, it's United Flight 175, uh, th- those planes didn't hit the buildings. Oh, we don't know what happened to the planes. We don't know what happened to the passengers. We do know that an awful lot of the bodies, almost a thousand of them, that were in the Twin Towers, simply vaporized. How would you vaporize bodies? Simply so go up on the Internet and look at Building 7 come down. See how the top of the building, instead of falling off as it starts to do, simply vaporizes and then it collapses quickly. You have to watch it. Remember, it comes down to about six or seven seconds. You have to watch it repeatedly, watch Building 7 come down, and then understand that most of what you believe is simply not true. So basically, of course, our telephone number, one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven, one eight hundred five four four eight nine two seven. If you want to know the true story, I said the of, of basically of uh, what happened that day, nine eleven. 9-11 update and the third 4-CD set, Why Do the Buildings Come Down? And then we have Richard Gage's excellent DVDs. Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truths is to ask for the Richard Gage. We have two of his DVDs, and you'll see in great detail what happened. He has almost 2,000 scientists who say it is a Sydney. Oh, we need an independent evaluation. We've not been told the truth. And you're never going to hear this on regular channels. A scientist who looked at the pictures and they know we've been lied to. If you want to know something about the murder of John Kennedy, we have certainly uh, interviews there. We have an interview with certainly uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson's mistress. I think that's in our, one of our JFK. That, that's JFK. We have JFK, JFK update. And they're, certainly they're both available by calling 1-800-544-8927. And you can actually hear JFK, pardon me, uh, Lyndon Johnson's mistress saying that how Lyndon Johnson went to a meeting the night before they killed Kennedy and came out of the meeting and said to her, well, after tomorrow, we're not going to have to worry about that GD Kennedy anymore after tomorrow and basically they killed President Kennedy we have a four CD set on how they killed Bobby Kennedy a four CD set on how they killed Martin Luther King including interviews with a lawyer who was hired by Martin Luther King's family and who actually carried out the trial of course you never heard about the trial the last thing they want is for the public to know that they actually the family actually made arrangements for a trial and they did have a trial. They presented the evidence showing that Martin Luther King was assassinated, totally blacked out by the controlled media. They're available by calling 1-800-544-8927, one 800 We need your financial help. Give us a call. We'd love to welcome you into the Radio Liberty family of supporters. Oh, 